And so the first thing you have to grasp if you're looking at this conflict is that it's a war. And there's two parties. They've been fighting each other for about 100 years. The Palestinian population was disenfranchised, uh, some of it under uh, Israeli occupation, some of it expelled, some of it fled. And the Palestinians ever since have been working and fighting for their rights to have a state in, the, in, in their homeland. Uh, the attack itself is controversial. The Israelis and the Americans and many people in the West call it terrorism. Other people call it legitimate resistance. It's a huge debate which is not easy to resolve because these technical terms are, are very tricky. The real problem is in Israel and in the United States. The United States is starting to change now. They're, they're, they're looking at recognizing a Palestinian state. That, uh, they keep talking about... So again, this is important. When did Joe Biden start talking about a two-state solution? It was three, four, three weeks after Hamas uh, invaded Israel on October 7th. Again, that's a consequence of this, this very dramatic but very controversial move. And if the Americans are serious about a two-state solution, they, they have to work for it and not just give us uh, empty talk. Hi, hello and welcome. This is Mid-Atlantic, the podcast. And today we're diving into a critical and timely issue with a very special guest. Joining us is Rami Kahuri, a renowned figure in the fields of journalism, academia and international policy. Kahuri serves as the Director of Global Engagement at the University at the American University of Beirut. His voice resonates globally as an internationally syndicated political columnist and author and is recognized for his peace promoting efforts. Today, our conversation with Rami Kahuri takes on an urgent and poignant subject, the ongoing Israeli invasion of Gaza and the dire plight of the Palestinian people. We're addressing a particular alarming prospect, Gaza being on the brink of famine. A UN-affiliated panel has issued a stark warning about the imminent threat of famine in Gaza, a crisis exacerbated by logistical challenges and the lengthy inspections that are severely, severely hindering the delivery of much needed aid. Rami Kahuri, uh, welcome to Mid-Atlantic. How are you today? I'm good. Uh, just to correct the pronunciation, my name is Kuri or Kuri. Kuri. You know, uh, thank you for, for pulling me up, sir. Tell us about where you were when the news of the attack, uh, the Hamas's attack on southern uh, Israel happened. Where were you? What were your initial thoughts, sir? I was uh, in uh, Cambridge, uh, Boston, near Boston, the New World, Cambridge, um, uh, where I live and work. I've been here for three years now. I've, after 15 years at American University of Beirut in Lebanon, I've been here, and uh, we heard the news uh, you know, in the, kind of the afternoon, I guess it was, or no, in the morning here, and it wasn't clear at first, and then it became clear that it was really very significant uh, development. In hindsight, should we have been shocked, surprised that Hamas launched an attack on Israel with hindsight? Somebody follows the Palestine-Israel or the Arab-Israeli conflict seriously, uh, no, uh, they shouldn't be surprised at all. This has been a conflict that's gone on for actually about 100 years or so. Uh, it was in 1923 that the League of Mandate, uh, the League of Nations gave a mandate to Great Britain uh, to uh, be in charge of the areas that were taken over from the Ottoman Empire and Palestine. Uh, but uh, Great Britain and France uh, took charge of those uh, areas in 1923, and now it's 101 years, uh, and this is still going on. So. These kinds of uh, actions, uh, whether they're individual attacks or uh, official state attacks or done by non-state actors like uh, Hamas, uh, small groups of guerrilla fighters, whatever it may be, it's, uh, freelance uh, uh, terrorists, uh, Jewish settlers in the West Bank, and on both sides you have all kinds of actions, um, and uh, they're part of a war. So the first thing you have to grasp if you're looking at this conflict is that it's a war and there's two parties they've been fighting each other for about a hundred years so it's not really very useful or very accurate for anybody to say well 
you know, let's say October 7 is when all of this started, or it was the Oslo talks, or 1948. All of these are important milestones, uh, or 1967. Uh, but the the overall conflict has been going on, and it's a struggle between two people, the Jewish people who, became, who then created the state of Israel, and the, or at least the Zionist movement within the Jewish people, which was a very small movement when it started. Uh, they came to create a state, and they did, and Israel was created. And on the other hand, there's the people of Palestine, who, who never had their own state, as no, none of the people there. Iraq or Jordan or Lebanon, so all these people had states, uh, until statehood started to happen in the first uh, third of the 20th century. And the Palestinians uh, were unable to confront the, the Zionists and their Western supporters, and Israel was created. The Palestinian population was disenfranchised, uh, some of it under uh, Israeli occupation, some of it expelled, some of it fled. Um, and the Palestinians ever since have been uh, working and fighting for their rights to have a state in, the, in, in their homeland. Uh, so that's the, 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 this battle has been going on all this time. And, uh, it, it, cha- it changed and evolves. There's different actors, different conditions. Uh, but the fundamental struggle is between the Palestinian and the, uh, let's say, Jewish, Zionist, Israeli people uh, for control of this land or for their share of this land in which they can set up their own state. It's interesting you say that this conflict is between the Palestinian people and uh, the Israeli people. Uh, if you look at the history of the conflicts, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but it's an important place for us at least to start to understand where where we get to from, let's say, 1947 and the UN partition through to October the 7th in 2023. It's it's important for us to at least frame it before we move on to the current conflict. One of the things that does mark the conflict is how um, this was truly an Arab on Israeli conflict, historically. And then as of, let's say, the Six Days War, Um, fundamentally various Arab parties have kind of dropped out. The fact that now this does at least appear to be a Palestinian and Israeli conflict, how does that kind of shape um, the aspirations for, and and also the means that the Palestinian people have to try and affect um, their their own recognised state? It's very... uh complex only in the sense that conditions keep evolving and the actors keep evolving and their capabilities keep evolving. Uh, So the Palestinian people, when this conflict started, if you could say night in the 1930s, became serious, um, you didn't, the Palestinians did not have the capabilities, military, technological, they didn't have the diplomatic co- connections in Europe and North America, which the Zionists did. They, most of them came from Europe. They're Europeans, the European Jews. Uh, they didn't have the uh, organizational capabilities. There wasn't a coherent national um, movement. Uh, so they, they, the Palestinians uh, were very weak, and they couldn't really defend themselves against both the British colonizing or the British authority in charge of the area and the very well-organized, well-armed Zionist military groups. And therefore, Israel was created, the Palestinians were uh, defeated, and uh, many of them expelled. Um, And and this has been the situation ever since. There has not been a coherent Palestinian state or uh, really leadership uh, that was able to... uh, harness all the incredible support that the Palestine cause has all around the world, not just the Arab world, but you see it now in the last month or two, these amazing, massive demonstrations, including in London, there were two, 300,000 people, uh, Indonesia, and uh, yeah, anywhere you go in the world, all over the world, you have these things. Every time Biden gives a speech now, and the U.S., he's interrupted with hecklers, say, genocide, Joe, ceasefire now. So there's tremendous support for the Palestine issue. There always has been. Um, 
Um, but there has never been a Palestinian government that is capable to harness it and engage the Israelis in a serious diplomatic uh, discussion, uh, negotiation, to try to resolve the issue. Uh, we could not uh, meet the Israelis on the battlefield because we didn't have the capabilities. Now, this is where Hamas becomes uh, significant. Uh, Hamas has developed since the 19, late 1980s, and uh, it has become, over time, a very proficient military force. Uh, and we've seen its abilities, whether you agree with what they do or you don't, you have to admire what they've been able to do, both to keep resisting against Israel over all these years, to carry out the attack on October 7. Again, I'm not saying it's great, I'm not saying you should judge it as good, but just recognize what the, the capabilities they had developed to be able to do that was quite significant. And and then to protect themselves uh, in their underground system in other ways uh, in the last four months almost. Uh, so this is what's important today, that there is this new capability uh, that Hamas has, and it is um, uh, shaking up the diplomatic landscape in a very significant way. Mr. Kahori, I I'm going to qu quickly stop you because I, I think what you said is something which is actually quite profound, but I actually disagree. I, I, I don't believe that, number one, right, and we have to be incredibly careful um, with, with what I'm, I'm going to try and be very careful with what I'm going to say now. The, the fact that such an audacious attack invasion could happen is literally incredible considering the economic blockade and the level of surveillance which the Israeli state has on Gaza. So it shows you there's been a shocking breakdown of intelligence in Shin Bet. The fact that that could even happen on such a coordinated um, um, scale. That's one. that I don't think anybody can, can deny that. Right. But, I, but where I disagree with you is when you said that that has garnered international support. I think what has garnered international support is the hopelessness of the Palestinian people who are trapped between um, a lack of having a viable state and then with the what appears to be the disproportionate Israeli response to that attack on. I think that's the reason why uh, international public opinion is swinging against Israel. A and historically, there has been, at least in left-leaning politics in Europe, sympathy for the Palestinian cause. That goes back decades. And, um, and it's not by accident that South Africa led the charge to the ICJ because um, the, the, the ANC and the PLO were two liberation movements in the 1960s. So I disagree with you that it's any lauding of Hamas per se, but it's that but people recognize that the Palestinian people um, are in the middle of what is potentially a, a genocide. And, and that's there's legal scholars are saying that and the hopelessness of their position. Right. Yeah, you're right. I'm, uh, I'm not saying that there's global support for the attack on October 7th. There's global support for the Palestinian people who are struggling for their rights and to live in their land peacefully with the state of Israel, or they want to make one state or whatever they want. Uh, that's where the support is, uh, is massive. The attack itself is controversial. The Israelis and the Americans and many people in the West call it terrorism. Other people call it uh, uh, legitimate resistance. It's a huge debate, which is not easy to resolve because these technical terms are, are very tricky. Um, but certainly, uh, m many Palestinians are not uh, happy with uh, attacks against civilians. Um, you know, the the general uh, dividing line in the Arab world, as I see it, I've lived there most of my life, is that people say that if you attack an Israeli settlement with soldiers in it, or an Israeli army camp, that's perfectly legitimate, because this is soldier against soldier. But if you go and, and bomb a bus in Tel Aviv, or blow up a pizza parlor, or kill uh, people who are dancing, well, that's not really uh, resistance, that's closer to terrorism. So this, I don't want to get into that argument, because it'll never end. Uh, and um, I think what we have to do to, if 
if anybody seriously wants to assess this conflict, they have to apply the same standard of morality and law and decency to both sides. So I, you know, I, I do a lot of lecturing and speaking, and people always ask me, "Will you condemn the uh, uh, the uh, October seven attack? Will you condemn it as terrorism?" I will say, "I will condemn all attacks against civilians by all sides as terrorism." But if you ask me to just take one uh, attack and ignore the others, I say, "No, I won't do that." But I don't think that's very helpful. It, it's not very uh, fair, and it doesn't particularly resolve anything. Uh, what we want to do is stop all the terrorism, stop the occupation, stop the siege, stop the subjugation, uh, and stop the cruelty. Uh, so, th so that's why I keep saying that unless we grasp the nature of this war that has two parties, and now there's other parties, of course, there's foreign parties who assist them, but the Palestinians and the Israelis are at war. And any assessment of anything they do uh, has to be uh, done in them. Uh, uh, in the basis that looks looks at them both, because that's the only way that we're ever going to try to find a way to resolve this conflict. Uh, if if the actions of both sides are judged uh, fairly and equally, same standards, we can then start moving to the situation, as happened in South Africa or Northern Ireland or other places where tough conflicts uh, were resolved um, politically, after a lot of warfare. And there's other areas where they haven't been resolved, like uh, Cyprus, for instance, uh, and other conflicts. So that, that that's my point. I always think that uh, the, 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 the example of Northern Ireland is probably the, one of the closest in terms of um, the, the two communities and the seemingly intractable nature of the conflict. Uh, terrorists on both sides, freedom fighters on both sides, etc. And then the position of the British government um, then actually in treating with the IRA, implacable terrorists. And, and they explain to people all the time that by the end of the 1990s, by the middle of the 1990s, not even the end, both sides realised that this was going to be an intractable uh, conflict and they had to sit down and talk to each other. Um but what I want to do is kind of move our conversation on just a little. Uh, the ICJ's historic ruling on Gaza kind of introduces um, this recent development of the, the International Court of Justice claiming jurisdiction over accusations of Israeli um, actions within Gaza, marking a significant legal milestone. Um, where does that politically move the, the needle in that, you know, it appears that Israel does have a case to answer in terms of its, uh, in terms of genocide and the its kind of disproportionate response and lack of care for for civilians. And um, where does that move the needle in this conflict? And then in terms of international perception. Yeah. So the International Court of Justice uh, decision, uh, well, uh, or interim or provisional, whatever it's called. It's very significant because this is the first time in the history of this entire conflict that the two sides were able to present their case in public at a legitimate venue, the, uh, the I siege the court, um, and they were judged by a panel of expert, impartial, honest people, men and women. Um, and this had never happened before. Uh, so what's, uh, yeah. what's important here is that the, um, the, the core issues of the conflict, the occupation, the terrorism, the subjugation, the annexation, the settler colonial expansion, all of the terrible things on, that have happened, and you can accuse both sides as much as anybody wants to, were put out, uh, put on the table for the first time. And this is really important here, which is that there wasn't really much opportunity for either side to try to use its behind the scenes and smoke filled rooms behind closed doors, lobbying, influencing, threatening, cajoling, enticing uh, people, which is 
has happened over the whole last hundred years. So the decisions were, were made out in the open according to a law standard that is internationally accepted. Uh, that's what's, what's significant. Out of the finding was what, what it was, which is that there's very plausible reason to uh, see uh, Israelis involved in a genocide or what could become a genocide, or whatever you want to phrase it, it doesn't matter. It's the same thing, that uh, uh, this is the things that have been happening, and especially if you see the provisional measures that the court issued, it just said, you know, stop the killings, stop the starvation, uh, provide humanitarian aid, etc. It went through everything that the Palestinians accused the Israelis of. Uh, the court said, well, these things should should be stopped. The court recognizes Israel has a right to defend itself. The Palestinians have a right to defend themselves. Everybody does. Uh, but there are rules of law, and they need to be uh, rules of war, and they need to be uh, adhered to what the Israelis were doing went way beyond any kind of reasonable response. You know, starving people and uh, and depriving them of, of water and food, and now there's all kinds of sick and illnesses that are spreading because of the lack of sanitation, medicating, bombing the hospitals, destroying the whole culture of the place, the schools, the mosques, the churches. Uh, what Israel has done is really unprecedented in, uh, in I think, in modern history, modern warfare. Um, and it will be uh, revealed once the guns fall silent. The, everything is documented. Everything is on the video. Um, the p people will document this for, for what it is, which is a very severe, um, cruel, almost barbaric episode, uh, which many supporters of Israel will tell you, look, you know, they had no choice. They had to do this. So, you know, the, the arguments on both sides will go on forever. But the fact that it went to this court and the court took these decisions is, is really significant. By the way, there's another court decision that was just made yesterday in California, where some Palestinians with the Center for Constitutional Rights in the U.S., which is a very respected uh, legal group that fights for justice, they took the President of the United States, Secretary of State, and Secretary of Defense, they charged them in a federal court in California with complicity with genocide, uh, that, or not, not adhering to their obligation under international law to prevent the genocide, because the U.S. was sending all these weapons to Israel nonstop, and they would be doing anything in the Security Council that would create a ceasefire. So there was a case in the U.S., and it was heard about three, two weeks ago, and the judge made his decision uh, yesterday, and it was really quite striking. Now, the judge said, I don't have the authority to tell the president to stop doing what he's doing. He says that is a jurisdictional issue which has to be resolved in the executive branch. But what he did say, which was astounding, a federal judge said that what the, the case presented certainly seems to show plausible implementation of genocidal actions. I mean, that's extraordinary when the federal judge in the U.S. says this. This is unprecedented. So one of the things that uh, is going on now is Palestinians all over the world finally are realizing that they have opportunities to use the established systems of governance, international uh, agencies, the UN, uh, the rule of law, courts, uh, media, whatever. They, If they work well and organize and work well, they can present their case better to the world and get a better response uh, from the world. It's not going to happen quickly. The U.S. is not suddenly going to turn against uh, Israel and say, look, you, we're, not, we're going to pull our money and our guns away. That's not going to happen. But what is happening, which is quite extraordinary, I mean, literally these few days, today the U.S. announced the State Department uh, or the President, uh, Biden, announced that he signed an executive order that would sanction and punish any Israelis who carried out extra to extrajudicial attacks against Palestinians in the West Bank. Um, and this is really quite significant. It's never happened uh, before. The other thing that's happened is that the State Department, Blinken, in Washington today revealed that he has asked for a review of uh, how could the U.S. recognize a Palestinian state this week or next week, you know, now. Uh, this is also unprecedented. 
most people assume that if a Palestinian state happens, uh, it'll then be recognized. But well, Blinken is looking at all, you know the U.S. and so all of this, uh, and there's other other things too that that are going on. But you, you, you are a hundred percent correct, and I, and I did want to come to that, but you've so, somewhat foreshadowed uh, another uh, one of my future questions. But but I'll bring it uh, to the fore now. Um, Lord Cameron, the UK's foreign secretary, has said that the UK government is looking into uh, recognizing a Palestinian state. And to go back to one of the, the points which you made a couple of minutes ago, that um, I think we've put a ban on issuing visas to anybody and anyone who's been in, implicated in uh, Israeli terror on the West Bank as well. Right. Um, it does. It does look like um, Western governments are inching towards and applying pressure on the Israeli state um, that um, uh, the defeat of Hamas doesn't mean that um, the Palestinian people can just live without democratic rights and can't have their own state, doesn't it? What we do, it, it looks like the West is slowly putting some incremental pressure on Israel, looking at a post-conflict solution. Right. That's happening, and it's happening partly, again, as we speak, as we speak in Paris, the U.S. CIA director, the head of Israeli intelligence, the Qatari foreign minister and an Egyptian official are meeting to thrash out a... Another round of a long-term truce or ceasefire in Gaza, where both sides would stop uh, military action, and then they start exchanging the hostages for prisoners in Israeli jails uh, over a period of. They're talking now about six weeks or something, six or eight weeks, um, and then and aid would flow normally. People can come and go wherever they want in Gaza, um, and then this would hopefully they their plan is to do this and then move on to the next stage immediately, which is a negotiation for a permanent uh, peace settlement between Palestine and Israel and other Arab countries, because Syria and Lebanon have occupied lands too. Um, and so th there's this extraordinary, uh, rather dramatic moves that are happening literally now, and they're only happening because of what Hamas did. And Hamas, and again, I'm not saying I support everything Hamas does, the point of Hamas and what it represents, like Hezbollah, like Ansarullah, the Houthis in Yemen and others, these resistance movements that came into being in the last 30, 40 years, really, that Hezbollah's from the early 80s, Hamas from the late 80s, these movements, they call themselves resistance movements. And resistance is what they do. Unlike the existing Arab governments or Arafat when he was uh, there, they don't just go and plead for, please, do you because uh, that's gotten us nowhere with the Israelis. Uh, so these guys, they say, look, we have to fight for our rights. And and they're doing that. We'd, it's better not to fight. It's better to negotiate. But if the Israelis and the Americans are not going to uh, negotiate uh, seriously, honestly, people are left with no choice. And this is human nature. It has nothing to do with Palestine or Israel. This is human nature anywhere around the world where we have an oppressive system the people being oppressed are going to resist. Um, and, and the ability of Hamas to do what it did has triggered this uh, all these uh, events, the, these ideas. And, and the more, more will come along, uh, too, as we continue down, down the road. So the, the best we can hope for is that people would harness the, the moment and their energies and to move into a serious negotiating process that recognizes the rights of Israelis and Palestinians to have their own state and live in peace, the guaranteed, but they have to have equal rights. So this is one of the critical things. So we, we, we don't want to set up another colonial Bantustan system. Uh, you know, the Israelis and the Americans, when they talk of states, they, they say uh, state, for, state for the Palestinians, but the Israelis have security rights to control the borders, or the Israelis have security rights for this. We're done with that. The Arab world is done with that. And they're saying, look, we will accept and live with the Israelis, which we've been saying, by the way, since 2002, the Arab peace plan. 
We will live with them, total security, total peace, total recognition, open borders, trade, everything. But only when Palestinians have the same rights as the Israelis. The Israelis are not prepared to do that yet. The Americans are inching towards that uh, uh, arena. They're slowly, slowly recognizing that they cannot be uh, colonial oppressors as they are now and claim that they're working for democracy and human rights and peace. Uh, so this is the very significant. I mean, for the British government, which is, you know, if there's a prize for colonial cruelty and oppression and ravages around the world, uh, the British will probably get that prize uh, because of what that happened under British colonialism. Uh, listen, absolutely. Uh, Britain Britain does get the Olympic gold uh, in that. What I want to do, just very quickly, I just want to go come on to um, Gaza being on the brink of famine and what we can do. And then I want to end our bit of a, a conversation looking at, which, which you've actually touched on, um, what happens when the guns stop. So um, Gaza is on the brink of famine. Um, there is a humanitarian crisis. And some of the facts and figures are just utterly stunning for me. So if we look at uh, Rafa, Rafa is a city of a quarter of a million people, and it's right on the border, southern Gaza, w w with Egypt. Currently, over half the population of the whole of Gaza, so... At least one one point six million people are actually no sorry let's get them right um, one point three million people are now in Rafa um, without adequate food and 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 water and, and, and to the point of which you're saying about Western governments inching towards applying pressure on Israel it's because of situations like this. Um, but we also have UNRWA um, also being discredited and, and and also being defunded. So can you just kind of speak to um, the, this kind of the plight of the Palestinian people, the plight of over half the population of the whole of Gaza, um, homeless and displaced within Rafa, a place which is only uh, built for a quarter of a million people, and, and, and just the sheer devastation which has actually happened in Gaza, i.e., was it 70% of all buildings have some level of destruction? 90% of the population is displaced. Um, what can we do? What should we do to help alleviate um, this humanitarian crisis where it looks like the next phase is actual starvation? Well, I, th I would first say that what we have to be honest and recognize is that while the first, say, two months, two and a half months of the Israeli assault on Gaza were taking place, most of the world, most of the Western world, was not, uh, you know, openly saying, you know, this has to stop. They were saying, oh, try to kill a few less civilians or whatever. There, there was no serious movement to stop the Israelis uh, because the, the, the anger... Uh, of many people against what happened on October 7 was so strong. And the Israelis were masters at, you know, sh showing the world that they had been uh, 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 treated like animals in the Holocaust. And now they tell the world, this is like that. This is the most people killed in one day since the Holocaust. So the Israelis are very good at uh, political public relations and projecting their case, even though they exaggerate and they lie and they distort. But they're very good at that. And therefore, most of the world was not moved to do anything for the first two months. Um, it was only when it became clear that what was going on was actually a genocide, that the Israelis wanted to, to remove the people out of Gaza, try to get them into the Sinai. They couldn't get do that because the Egyptians refused. The Americans and Israelis tried to convince them, buy them off, which is what they usually do with you know, uh, non-white people in the South, they give them some money or give them a car and, and they get what they want. But this, this just didn't uh, happen. Um, and then when this uh, got to the International Court of Justice and it looked like Israel was going to be uh, held out in front of the world as a country practicing genocide, um, then people started getting scared. But the most important thing, I think, 
in the American case, England, I'm not there, so I can't tell, but in the American case, the, the main driver of the beginning of a change in the Biden position is they were afraid of losing the election in November because Arab Americans, Muslim Americans, Black Americans, Hispanic Americans, you know, people of color, and, and other, they were all absolutely appalled by the American position, the the cruelty, the the insensitivity, the barbarism of it, um, and you know, uh, it was all they could see it all on TV. You could see children being, you know, their legs being amputated with no anesthesia. Unbelievable stuff. Unbelievable scenes uh, of of killing and inhumanity, practiced by Israelis, by Jews, uh, and and this uh, when the U.S. refused to do a ceasefire. Vita a ceasefire at the UN. Then the American uh, uh, groups who were uh, linked with the Global South started to say, look, we're not going to vote for Biden. Uh, we're going to vote for you know Mickey Mouse before we vote for Biden. And this scared the daylights out of Biden. And that's when people started moving, when they saw that their domestic political fortunes were going to get hurt. And, and, the, and they were also being charged with complicity uh, in genocide, that they were liable because of their support for the Israeli government's actions. So things did start to change, and we're in, right in this process. Literally, this week is, is the most dramatic week that we've seen where, where changes are happening. The Israelis, of course, released that dossier, so-called dossier, about 12 people out of 12,000 Gazans who work for Ottawa uh, being part of Hamas or some being involved. Um, they released that on the same day as the ICJ, the court, uh, clearly wanting to divert attention from it. And now, in the last three, four days, it's become clear that you know much of the information in the dossier is probably not accurate. Uh, two or three of the people have died already, whatever, the, 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 so it can't be verified. The UN cl has looked into it and, and is going to come up with any kind of evidence they can. Uh, and if there are people, if there were a few individuals in uh, UNRWA employees, school teachers, drivers, whatever, who were somehow linked to Hamas, they should be, well, they're fired already, and, they, and maybe they'll be prosecuted. But you can't take a, you know, a whole, you know, in the United States, you had American police and, and, and um, officials who were involved in the assault on the Congress in January 2000, whatever it was, 2000, uh, uh, the yeah, 2010. Yeah. Uh, so what do you do with them? So if you find 10 American officials who are involved in this terror attack against the Congress, this insurrection, do you then say the whole American government is complicit? It's not. You, so, I mean, so the Israelis clearly were very good, again, at manipulating um, knowledge, information, some of it inaccurately, and, and they're desperately trying to reduce the pressure on them because all over the world now, the U.S. and Israel are being singled out in a corner as killers, baby killers, whatever you want to call them. They're, they're not comfortable with this, and that's why I think we're seeing extraordinary change. But we should really capitalize on that to just get back to the main point of how do we achieve peace by achieving justice for both sides. That's that's the critical equation that we have to look at. The, 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 there is no two ways about it that whether it's a Democratic Party in the US or let's say the Labour Party in, in the UK, there is, um, there is internal pressure with some of their key constituencies who um, are... Um, and, and, it, and it's not binary, and I say this to people all the time, you can be... For a Palestinian state, that doesn't mean that uh, you're denying Israel the right to exist. Israel fought, has fought its wars, and Israel as a state isn't going anywhere. But neither are the Palestinian people, and they need to be able to have their own state. It's not binary. And so many people in, in, in the UK um, are, are making that case, and it's putting a lot of pressure on Keir Starmer. The, the Labour, the leader of the Labour Party. But there's also a lot of understanding that this is not a binary issue. You're kind of a pro-Palestinian, which means you're anti-Israeli per se, um, in that the the UK Foreign Affairs Select Committee, uh, their chairman, um, is very pro a, a Palestinian state. But again, you know, says, but that doesn't mean that Israel doesn't have the right to exist. 
So um, what I want to do now is just quickly pivot onto uh, talking about how um, a, pal a Palestinian state would actually look in, in, in real terms. I know that there are a lot of people in the audience who, who do have questions. So maybe we'll just spend five minutes on this. I know, Andrea, you said that uh, you wanted to ask a question. Uh, so um, I believe, um, Professor Corey, that this, that the needle has moved decisively in terms of the world's public opinion, in terms of understanding, at least having some level of empathy with the continued hopelessness of the Palestinian people. And, and I genuinely believe that the Israeli state will only have true security when it has a just and equitable peace with the Palestinian people. The very fact that American and British governments and other Western governments are, are not just saying that, let's say in the West Bank, there are illegal settlements, but actually enforcing that by giving travel bans. It, this is the lightest of light things, but they're, they're going on a journey. They're going on a journey. So whether it's in, let's say, five years, 10 years, um, if there is a Palestinian state, um, what would that state look like? Um, is it going to be Gaza and all of the West Bank with its capital being East Jerusalem? Um, give us the outlines of what a Palestinian state would actually truly look like, a truly sovereign, independent Palestinian state. Well, they would have to include essentially territory that is equivalent to what was in in the hands of Palestinians or administered by Jordan and Egypt before sixty seven, the West Bank and Gaza. Um, uh, that there would be twenty two percent of the land uh, of uh, historic Palestine has to be the Palestinian state, and the seventy eight that was Israel remains Israel now. Where that land is has to be negotiated. So the Israelis will expect, and most of the and the Palestinians have agreed to this, that these gigantic Jewish settlements all along the old green line between the West Bank and Israel, um, where there are hundreds of thousands of uh, settlers in uh, seven hundred thousand, yeah, uh, those will have to be incorporated into Israel, and. Israel will give the Palestinian state land of equal value, probably up in the Galilee and maybe down uh, in the south. We'll see. That'll have to be negotiated. The, a lot of the settlements in the interior of the West Bank or near the Jordan River will have to be evacuated. The Israelis will just have to uproot them and, and tell them, look, this is the cost of real peace. They did that before. They got settlers out of Sinai. They got settlers out of... Um, out of um, out of Gaza, yeah, in the early two thousand. Yeah, it was back for the Oslo process. They were, I think, four or five settlers, so they can do that if they want. If I think only when they, when the Israeli people and their leaders understand that they can actually get what they keep saying they want, which is to be recognized and to, and for people, their neighbors, to live in peace with them, and 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 end the war with them. When they, if that's available, I think they will get these settlers uh, removed without any problem whatsoever. The majority of Israelis are not committed to the settlement process. Uh, but in the present conditions of heightened emotions, of course, they're, all, they're saying, you know, something like 85% or something of Israelis say they think that the attacks against Gaza are justified. Then Israel is not using too much force because they're completely out of their mind. They're so angry. They, they want revenge. They want blood. And this is human nature. Um, many people act like this. Uh, the, the United States acted like this after 9/11. They just wanted to go and kill Muslims, uh, not all Americans, but uh, you know. But the, the political system was enraged, and it acted uh, in an enraged way. So, so that's a Palestinian state has to have Gaza, East Jerusalem, or much of it, and uh, the West Bank, and. I don't think these are going to be problems. I've been involved in enough track two meetings and formal meetings between Palestinians and Israelis, unofficial meetings to, to discuss. Well, how could we achieve these uh, this condition? 
there's been dozens and dozens of these meetings by very serious people, many of whom were former government officials. Um, and it's clear, we have the outlines uh, of, a, of a peace agreement very clear. And, and uh, the Israelis have to make the fundamental decision that they will live in peace with a Palestinian state that has the same rights as the Israeli state does. The only area where the Palestinians have agreed to make a concession, and this is probably for a limited period of time, is that the Palestinian state would be demilitarized, uh, would not have an offensive army. And the Palestinians said, no problem. We're not, you know, we're not here to take over other people or subjugate them like the Zionist movements of the Israeli government was. Uh, so other than that, the, everything has to be of equal rights. And, and includes things like, I mean, if I was a Palestinian negotiator, if the Israelis say, look, we need a, a, an electronic monitoring station on top of this mountain to make sure that no Palestinians are going to sneak up on us at night, I would tell them, fine, have your monitoring station. We want a monitoring station next to Hebrew University in Jerusalem to make sure that none of your crazies are going to come and attack us. It has to be reciprocal. Reciprocity is the key to progress, to, to justice, to equal rights, and to peace. But, but that's interesting, though, because whilst you've ended by talking about reciprocity, um, actually there isn't asymmetry because you're conceding and I think you're wise to, and any Palestinian negotiator will be wise to, to say that we won't have an army, right? We will, we will have, a, a, you know, we won't even have a, de a defense force. We'll have a souped up police force and that's it. So oh. it isn't reciprocity. And, and I think we all have to recognize, and, and I think w what you said is also very wise, that Palestinian negotiators have recognized that the founding of the state of Israel was special in inverted commas. Uh, and this state has been attacked numerous times. In 1967, it attacked Egypt. So it's not all one-way traffic. By any stretch of imagination, there has been the invasion of southern Lebanon in the 1980s, etc. Uh, but actually, even a Palestinian state, which uh, Palestinians would agree to, is number one, giving up land which his, which international law says is Palestinian land, the 1967 borders, um, and those uh, Israeli settlements are actually illegal, and the Palestinian state um, is is going to give up having an army, which um, out of the UN's, what, 195 countries, I think all of them bar Costa Rica have an army of some sort, and maybe Monaco, right? right. So, And even the Vatican state has an army of sorts, you know, so... <laughs> So, um, but on that note, on that note, because I don't want to take up um, too much of everybody else's time because we do have a, a, a small but committed audience with us. Andrea, you said that you wanted to ask a question uh, to Mr. Kahori. So, Andrea, now is your time. Thank you so much, Royfield, for this. And Dr. Corey, um, this has been one of the best uh, sessions I've listened to on this topic. So I'm very grateful Um for your perspective and experience. Uh, very quickly, um, I believe I know, but I'd rather hear from you clarified in the two-state solution, what happens to Hamas? Where are they in the picture? Uh, because originally they had as part of their mandate and they were elected by the Palestinian people um, to, I believe, destroy the state of Israel. And I'm hoping you'll correct me if I'm incorrect. But I believe they then removed that from their mandate. So that's what happens to Hamas. And then in your view, how what possible explanation could you give for how it is taking the U.S. so long? I know Israel is an ally, so there's complications about needing to back your ally. But to come down a bit harder on this situation when clearly uh, it has gone beyond it feels like even with Israel's right to defend itself, a disproportionate response. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Oh, you bet. Um, so there's many reasons why the U.S. has taken this very severe, one-sided pro-Israeli position. Um, uh, there's about six or seven different uh, dimensions of it, and they evolve a little bit over time. Um, but uh, it basically includes things like uh, political leaders in the U.S. benefit when they are seen, usually 
feel they benefit when they are supporting a state that says it's the state of the Jewish people. Uh, they f- Leaders feel they benefit when they are uh, seen to be giving protection to the Jewish people who were so uh, grievously and criminally uh, mistreated uh, in Europe. Uh, but not, and not just under Hitler, uh, but white racist European and North American systems starting in the late eight, 19th century. Uh, remember, Zionism started 40 years before Hitler. So uh, the, 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 the Holocaust speeded up the process of Jewish migration to Palestine and the, the urgent need to create a state where the Jews could live in peace because the Americans wouldn't take them in Great Britain. You wouldn't take them. There were laws that were passed to pre- prevent or slow down the immigration of Jews from Europe um, as early as 1910 in, in England, I think it was. In the U.S., it was in the 20s. Um, uh, and therefore, the uh, state of Israel became a, a life or death imperative for Jewish people in Europe. Um, and, and, and politicians have strongly supported uh, the state of Israel in the U.S. ever since. Um, they think that uh, it's a strategic ally. In some cases, having a close ally like that where you can free position military equipment and uh, uh, use their um, uh, air, for, uh, air bases and stuff like that, and their intelligence system uh, it helps them and the, helps the U.S. and the Middle East. The Israelis align themselves always with the West against uh, the uh, enemy, which was, you know, back then it was, say, the Soviet Union or the Russians, or the Soviet Union, the East, Eastern Bloc, or the Cold War, Israel uh, presented itself as a democratic ally of the West, whereas many Arabs were with the Soviets. Um, there's many, many different reasons. Uh, there's also a, a strong streak of Christian fundamentalist extremism in the United States. And this was there in England. It's one of the reasons that the British and the Balfour Declaration happened in 1917, why British officials supported the creation of a a Jewish state in Palestine at the same time as these same British leaders refused to allow legislation that would permit the Jews to come into England. They said, no, we don't want you to help you. We don't want you to come to our country. You go somewhere else. And uh, this Christian fundamentalist sentiment uh, has many different dimensions to it, but it, it came into play uh, and still does. So now you find that the American Christian fundamentalist extremists, not all of them, but the extremists are very pro-Israeli. And, uh, and this is a shift uh, that's happened uh, uh, over the years. Uh, so so um, and there's probably one or two uh, uh, two other, uh, other reasons. Um, the, what was your first question? I'm sorry, it was just what happens to Hamas in the two states. Okay. The, that's something that will be decided by the Palestinian people and in the negotiations with Israel. But let me give you one hint. You're never, what, uh, this is what makes Hamas and people like Hezbollah and others like them, these resistance movements, this is what makes them different than everything people in the West have been used to in, in the Arab world. They won't tell you. You'll never get an answer to that question they, uh, because they learned. If they make concessions ahead of time, if they say, okay, we will demilitarize and we will become a, uh, a social uh, welfare agency, which is what they started as. Hezbollah and Hamas both started as uh, social justice, social development agencies for their communities, uh, schools, medical clinics, etc. cetera. Um, uh, if they were to make that concession, uh, early on, the the Israelis would say, oh, wonderful, thank you very much, we'll take that, which is what they did with Arafat, with Oslo. They took, you know, the concessions that, that Arafat made and gave almost nothing back in return, but they kept colonizing and building settlements, killing Palestinians. So uh, Hamas will not tell you, uh, will not accept, not you, but the Israelis' terms, uh, unilaterally and beforehand. These will be negotiated. But Hamas has clearly made it known through uh, interviews, through their writings, through changing their charter, through many things. They are prepared to coexist in peace 
with the state of Israel as it is now, which is you know majority Jewish, minority Arab, they're prepared to live in peace if the occupation from '67 is ended, if Israeli attacks against Palestinians are ended, and if the fundamental uh, issues related to the Palestinian refugees are addressed. And that's the most complicated one. Uh, so there's there's about five, six million Palestinian refugees around the region that say they should go back to their homes in what is now Israel. That's not going to happen. The Israelis won't accept it, and we understand that. Um, but there has to be some recognition of the rights of these Palestinians, which are in UN resolutions, by the way. And, and that's one of the reasons why UNRWA continues to exist, the UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees, which is a big controversy now. The Israelis have tried for years to get rid of UNRWA, but the UNRWA is there because these Palestinian refugees in exile are seen to be members of a coherent community, the Palestinian community, who one day should have the right to go back to their homes. If they don't go back to their homes in Israel, then they'll go to a Palestinian state, some of them. But until then, somebody has to provide them with their basic needs, and, and that's what, uh, what what UNRWA, UNRWA does. So the, the issues of um, what happens when a Palestinian state is created to the leadership of Palestine, to Hamas, to other things, these will come out of the negotiations. The Palestinian people are unbelievably skilled and reasonable and able. Um, they're not uh, going to miss an opportunity to negotiate seriously for a resolution of their statelessness, disenfranchisement, and exile. They will work for their own rights and their own state. And they've accepted, and virtually everything that Israel has asked of the Palestinians, uh, the Palestinians have accepted, uh, you know, including a demilitarized state and less land and this and that. Uh, so the real problem is in Israel and in the United States. The United States is starting to change now. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're looking at recognizing a Palestinian state. Uh, they keep talking about... So again, this is important. When did Joe Biden start talking about a two-state solution? It was three, four, three weeks after Hamas uh, invaded Israel on October 7. Again, that's a consequence of this, uh, this very dramatic but very controversial move. Um, and uh, if the Americans are serious about a two-state solution, they they have to, you know, work for it and not just give us uh, empty talk. Um, and it's the Israelis that are the main problem. They still have not fully accepted that the people of Palestine and the people of Israel actually should have equal rights under law, under God, and under diplomatic agreements. The, the, once the Israelis come around to recognizing. That will be a historic uh, moment because it will mean that they would finally, after 120 years, uh, well, well, not 120 years, uh, yeah, 120 years, they would have finally defined what Zionism means in terms of its borders, uh, its people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Zionism has never been defined uh, other than a movement for national uh, re re recreation of an, an, an of an state for the Jewish people. Uh, but it's been a colonial settler state that expands and takes Palestinian land and does what it's doing in, in Gaza. But once you have a permanent agreement, you'll, that Zionism will be defined and contained, and it'll respond to what the Jews uh, rightly asked for. And it will also respond to what the Palestinians asked for, which is not to have the Jewish state constantly uh, attacking us. But that does presuppose a, a massive change in Israeli internal politics, doesn't it? That those extreme right-wing parties, uh, which are led by people like Ben Gavir, and their kind of messianic uh, belief in from the river to the sea, quite literally, and that's what they say, that mm -hmm. those parties need to be... Um, they, these are relatively fringe parties, but they're propping up Likud, and it's, uh, those keeps uh, Netanyahu in power. But Netanyahu has always said from the 1970s that he doesn't want a two-state solution. So we need a massive change in internal Israeli politics. And considering how unpopular Netanyahu is um, internally in Israel, um, 
But, and as you said, there is this understandable, almost bloodlust in terms of what was done was so unexpected, so terrible that we just need to wipe out Hamas. But, but you, it's not inconceivable that post the conflict, there's going to be a realignment is in Israeli internal politics, which could well get us to a place where Israelis who are in the center are on the left. Um, really do say that we need a settlement, that there is a, a, a solution cannot be to f- destroy 70% of the buildings in Gaza, because all that's doing is acting as a recruiting st- sergeant for more people who are implacably against the state of Israel. You're not winning over any hearts and minds doing that. Uh, Jim, you've raised your hands and also for other people, because I do want to start to try and, and wind this up. Uh, we've had Mr. Corey for o- over an hour. So if you do want to ask a question, please raise your hand. But Jim, my good friend in Atlanta, uh, the, the stage is yours. Um, hi, Roy Field. Um, hi, Dr. Corey. Great podcast, as always. Um, just a couple. I'll, I'll try to be uh, brief in my questions. Um, Dr. Corey, um, do you think you, you, you spoke about 101 years? Um, that sort of takes us back to the Balfour Declaration. Do you think the Balfour Declaration in and of itself is where things became exceedingly problematic? And, and sideways um that's question one question two early on i thought i heard you say there's never been a palestinian government capable of engaging the israelis did i hear you correctly on that pretty much yeah okay so now it, it is it possible to have a Palestinian government capable of engaging the Israelis? Now, I get what you're saying about going back to the pre-67 border. And I get what Royfield said, that there has to be a, a huge political shift to get there. So, um, uh, is there a capable polit- Palestinian government if, there's, if Netanyahu's government is gone and the fundamentalists are gone. And hallelujah of what you said about the fundamentalist Christians in America and England, preventing the Jews from coming. Because go, go, going back to the protocols of the elders of Zion, right? Those were, those were, uh, and they are still in effect, right? They're still in effect going back to January 6th. Is there a capable government of Palestine to negotiate with a new government in Israel, is that is my question? Yeah, see, you know the protocols are a f- fabrication. You know that they're not. Involved. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So the um, the uh, answer is absolutely. The Palestinians can have a government that is able to uh, engage with the Israelis or any government in the world. I mean, the people. I don't know if you've been to Palestine or if you know Palestinians, but there's just thousands of amazingly skilled, educated, uh, mobile people, cultured, etc. cetera. Um, so that's not a problem but if they're given a chance. The problem is every time that there has been a government, uh, it's, ta- it's been um, able to uh, concentrate power and not act democratically. There was a brief period uh, after Oslo uh, when there was a, elections for a national council and things like that and the parliament and uh, in fact, Hamas was elected, and they won an election. That's how they got to be um, to run the government before the <clears throat> West Bank and Gaza split. So, yeah, I have no 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 uh, problem, no no concerns about that. The uh, we are a, perfectly capable of running ourselves. We don't have to have this nonsense, this Orientalist racist n- nonsense that we get out of uh, Europe and North America and Israel, where oh, the Palestinians need somebody to come and help them uh, run their society. Um, the first point you mentioned, yes, the Balfour Declaration was the uh, was the critical uh, f- turning point, which was preceded, though, by acts of great dishonesty by the British colonial government, which is typical of governments and certainly typical of the British colonial government, where they promised the Arabs something and they promised the Israelis something. Uh, and then they reneged on the promise to the Arabs. And that was the McMahon uh, 
uh, pledge. Yeah. But uh, ju- ju- just just for historical accuracy, there were no Israelis back then uh, at the end of the First World War. So, you know, yeah, that's right. you know, Jews. You, Jews right. So, yeah, the yeah. Alcor Declaration was the what, what, what brought the Zionist movement into the international legal system. And then the mandates with the League of Nations gave it the force of law. If you look at the mandate of 22, decided in 22, implemented in 1923, you read it. It's a very short uh, document, about 10 pages. It's amazing. It, it, it's, a, it's like it was written, and parts of it probably were, by the Zionist movement, which is exactly what's in the Balfour Declaration. Um, and they, you know, they say the mandate is to do this and that and make sure that a Jewish home, a national home, uh, is established, uh, and this is what happened. Uh, and we couldn't uh, confront these. We didn't have the skills or the means or the connections to confront these people. But the amazing thing about Palestine, and we should end here, is that the the Palestinians are really uh, quite unusual for continuing their struggle over a century. Uh, because even when in the earliest days when this started to happen, Palestinians were kind of some of them were wondering what's what's going on here. Are they going to come and try to take our state, take our rights away? There was no state then, but um, but we for a century we've struggled for our rights, um, and we're still struggling against tremendous odds. Um, and so, but it seems, uh, and I'm 75 years old. I was born in 1948, so. I've lived, this has been my whole life, but it seems to me that this year is the, uh, is the turning point, uh, 2023, 2024. Is- you know what, sorry, so just to, just to jump in, because I, I, I don't know, kind of, kind of wrap this up. I find that, um, fascinating and somewhat surprising. So after the Oslo Accords, were you not, do, does this feel more promising than the mid nineties when, you know, Yasser Arafat sat down with Yuxhat Rabin. You know that sh- sh- surely that that was the time when we all thought that this uh, conflict. That brought a lot of a lot of people were hopeful then, uh, but a lot of people were against it, and uh, it wasn't clear it was going to work, and it didn't work because the Israelis were not serious. Uh, but this is something serious. I've got to run. Uh, yes, I, 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 okay. Um, let, let's just wrap this up. And uh, Mr. Corey, uh, thank you f- for being with us. Uh, let me just formally wrap up the podcast. Thank you, Jim, for your question. Jim, whenever you come on camera, I have such hair envy. You have wonderful hair, sir. And and I love the way you stroke it, Jim. So well done to you, sir. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Corey. Um, if people want to maybe catch up with you on social media and or me- any of your writings, where can they do that, sir? Well, on Twitter, and it's at Rami, Rami Furi, one word. I know. Absolutely. There you go. Super, super simple. Um, like thinking around there. I will continue to do these uh, deep dives with uh, key thinkers around the Israel and Palestinian issue. Uh, for as long as this conflict continues. Obviously, Mid-Atlantic's bread and butter is to look at US and UK news and views. But um, I am a a committed person who's fascinated by the world of geopolitics. Really, my love ultimately is history. And I did say this before we actually hit hit the record button, that at the age of uh, nine or ten, I was fascinated. But when I got a book from Perry Bar Library, about the Six Days War. And I was, as as little boys are in short trousers, I was amazed by the skill and the fortitude of the Israeli army and the dashing Musha Dayan with his, uh, with his eye patch. However... But give, I, I'm sorry, I've got to run. I've got somebody... You, you, you can go, sir. You can go. You can go. Thank you very, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. And I'm just going to um, just continue that for the sake of the uh, end, end of the podcast. But also, as well as I was somewhat enthralled to this dashing man with his eye patch, I also understood the, the tragedy of the Palestinian people, people who had lived on this land, in this land for, for eons, and then have found themselves displaced 
uh, and, and, and pushed down by this conflict in, in 1967. And yes, there was one in, in, uh, in 1948, but that's the book w which I uh, read and devoured from the library, which is just a mile down the road from where I live right now. And I've never forgotten that, that you have a people who had pogroms, um, as Professor Khoury said, not just a Holocaust in the Second World War, but historic pogroms throughout the history in Europe. Those pogroms were not started by the Palestinian people or the Arab people at all. And we understand uh, the, the need, the want, the desire, specifically after 1945, to give those people safe haven because they didn't have it in Europe. But then to dispossess the people who were living in that land, I think we can both see the tragedy on both sides. I think through the darkness and the brutality of the attack on southern Israel on the 7th of October, I think I do agree with Mr. Corey that actually we can now start to see light at the end of the tunnel for the Palestinian peoples that they can have their, their own land and, and live in some level of security. And we can see that because Western governments are slowly but surely coming to recognize their case. Again, you don't have to be anti-Israeli to understand and to empathize with the Palestinian people and the statelessness at all. And in, in it's a, a cause which I've always felt incredibly passionate about since the age of nine, 10, when I got that first book. The Israeli people need their own land and need security, but not at the expense of the Palestinian people. The two peoples can live side by side, as actually Jews and Muslims did in that land for eons, for literally 2,000 years since the Romans expelled the Jewish people in the first century AD. I've been Royfield Brown. This has been Mid-Atlantic. Take care. Look after yourselves. Bye-bye.